Philosophy and Philosophy of Law at Ruhr University in Bochum, that's in Germany. And I'm very proud to introduce our speakers for the last session. It's Thomas Vogel, the author of the of the Conference. And there's Daniel Essi, he's Hillhaus Professor of Environmental Law and Policy at Yale University here. And it's Jeffrey Sachs, he is the director of the Earth Institute and he's professor of sustainable development at Columbia University. He will talk about sustainable development goals. So, first speaker is Thomas. So, I will make a few critical remarks about the SDGs in the spirit of constructive criticism. I think that they have a good potential, but I think there are some things that need to be fixed or borne in mind in order to make that potential fully fulfilled. So the first critique has to do with the distribution of responsibilities. Both the MDGs and the SDGs have been weak on that point, I think, in making clear who has to do what to achieve those targets. So take a pretty random example. Reducing under five mortality rate uh, the MDG said this has to be reduced by two-thirds. We didn't actually achieve it. And uh, the SDGs are saying that all avoidable under five mortality has to be ended. And in both cases, uh, there was no specification of responsibility. So now at the end of the MDG period, it's unclear who has failed to do what they ought to have done in order to achieve that reduction. The reduction could obviously have been achieved but whose fault is that? Now, in the media, very often the tendency is to say, well, it's simple. If the world has to reduce by two-thirds, that means that every country has to reduce by two-thirds. And if every country did, the world would be reducing by two-thirds. But that distribution of responsibility is extremely unfair because it gives the least capable agents, namely the very poorest countries, the largest responsibilities. But given that no assignment of responsibilities is specified, uh, often that is the view that at least prevails in the Western countries. So the first critique basically is to make these truly development goals rather than development wishes, we have to specify a distribution, division of labor, a distribution of responsibilities. The second point is that I'm afraid that the uh, development goals often divert our attention to something that is really morally quite important. It attracts our attention, it focuses our attention on diachronic phenomena, namely how are things developing over time. So we tend to compare the state in 2015, say, with the state in 1990, the baseline, and we say, well, this got a lot better, this got a little better, and so on, and the comparison, by and large, looks pretty good. But I think there's another, even more important comparison that our attention is detracted away from, and that is the comparison with what would now be possible, the synchronic comparison with the existing state of affairs now. So take slavery, just uh, think back to 1845, and imagine somebody talking about slavery in 1845 and saying, look, you know, we have made progress on a whole lot of fronts. Whippings have become less frequent than they were in 1820. The rape of slave girls is much less common than it was. The splitting of families is much reduced. The one person gets sold into <coughs> one direction and another in another direction and so on. So on the whole, you know, slavery has gotten much, much better. Now, with hindsight, of course, we would say it's pretty irrelevant. Yeah, so, okay, it was even worse in 1820 than it is now in 1845. But the fundamentally important fact is that slavery can be abolished now, and it should be abolished now, regardless of how much worse it may have been in some earlier period. And I think that is what we should think about poverty. Poverty is something that can be avoided, can be abolished, and it could be gone now if we <coughs> work harder at it. And it is something that uh, we should avoid as quickly as we possibly can. The third point has to do with definition and measurement. So the point is that in the moment the international agencies are put in charge of defining uh, the goals, 
setting the targets and the indicators and so on, and also the measuring methods. And I think that they're unsuitable for that role simply because they're politically vulnerable, politically exposed agencies who cannot resist the pressure from governments to deliver good looking trend numbers, which of course governments have an interest in producing because governments in particular, the more powerful ones, want to show that their globalization project has been a success. I'll just give you one example of maybe one of the prominent uh, goals, the hunger goal, we want a world free from hunger. We've been wanting that for a long, long time. Roosevelt talked about FDR, that is, and many others have. And we still have very, very large numbers of hungry people. So I want to show you a little bit about how this particular goal has been treated. So start with the World Food Summit in Rome, where the idea of halving hunger came to social prominence. In 1996, 186 governments said that they would half hunger and they would half it uh, by 2015. Here is the promise in quote, and you can see that what they were talking about at that time was halving the number of chronically undernourished <coughs> people by 2015. The simple mathematics at that time, the official number was 888 million. So very simple mathematics, we are supposed to go down to 394 million by the year 2015. In the year 2010, the actual number was 925 million, so uh, we clearly had gone very dramatically in the wrong direction. Plus 17%, nowhere near, uh, you know, almost 50% that we want. Then came the uh, UN General Assembly's Millennium Declaration of the year 2000, where the pledge was, again, we will half hunger, but now the interpretation was we'll half the proportion of hungry people between 2000 and 2015. And here's the quote. And of course, halving a proportion is easier than halving a number if in the denominator, the world's population is going up. Uh, you can see that here with the mathematics, a little complicated, I'll run through it quickly. At that time, the official numbers stood at 833 million. You relate that to the world's population to find the ratio, you half the ratio, relate that to the expected world population in 2015 to find the permissible number, and you can see the permissible number of hungry people went up by 886, uh, by 86 million. Again, the 2010 number is 925, and so we look very bad, but we look better than we looked when we were just aiming to half the number. The first millennium development goal then came along and it made two fundamental changes. It said that we will half the proportion of uh, the hungry people relative to the population of the developing countries, which is faster growing than the population of the world at large. And it also backdated the baseline to 1990, thereby lengthening the period in which progress could be achieved and also taking advantage of the great poverty alleviation that China had achieved in the 1990s. So again, a significant shifting of the goalposts and dilution of the effort. So here again, the mathematics is we start with 843, the number of hungry people in the developing world in 1990, relate that to the population of the developing world in that year and so on. Long story short, the new target is 611 million undernourished people for the year 2016, and now for the first time, we've actually made progress. Yes, the number of hungry people has gone up between 1990 and 2010, but as a proportion of the even faster rising population of the developing countries, it's gone down by 21%. Now, that's still, 21% is still very bad. It's still very bad because we wanted to get to 50%, and 80% of the period has already passed between 1990 and 2010, and we've only achieved about 40% of the required progress. So what can still be done to make the whole thing less than a disaster? Well, what can still be done is you can change the method for counting the undernourished, and that's exactly what the FAO did. In 2012, they came out with an improved methodology from one state of food insecurity report to the next. These are annual reports. 
So in 2012, three years before the end of the 25-year monitoring period, they revised their method for counting the undernourished, and as you guessed, no doubt, the number for 1990 was revised upward, and the number for 2009-2010 was revised downward, and so you get now a very well-behaved uh, reduction in the number of chronically undernourished people, quite a divergence, as you can see, from the initial official <coughs> kind of numbers. Now, this, uh, the initial numbers had one thing in favor of them, one plausibility thing, that is that food prices had doubled. We all remember that from the Arab Spring and so on and so forth, as you can see it here from the FAO's own statistics. So what's really remarkable about the new numbers is that apparently poor people never noticed that food prices had doubled, despite the doubling of food prices between 2006 and 2008 and then 11. Uh, the number of chronically undernourished people continued their decline. Here is the infographic that the FAO helpfully included with its SOFI 2012 report, and you can see very steady reduction. We're a little bit above the life path, but we're essentially on target for achieving MDG 1. And I think that is probably also what will be announced uh, later this year, that we more or less achieved the halving of hunger during this period. Now, there is a cost, of course. The cost comes in the fine print when you look at how the FAO is defining undernourishment. It's defining undernourishment in the three defining characteristics, all three have to be present if you want to count as undernourished. The first one is that you have to be short of calories, so any other nutritional deficit is declared irrelevant. If you're short of minerals, short of vitamins, short of proteins, whatever it may be, uh, you do not count as undernourished. And the food energy is focused on dietary intake. So what matters is how many calories you ingest into your mouth. That ignores, for example, absorption problems, that many people in developing countries have parasites who share their meals and so get up to one-third less calories actually into their system than the calories that they ingest. But again, the FAO does not consider that. It just counts ingested calories. The second element of the definition is that the number of calories that you need are those that are covering the minimum needs for a sedentary lifestyle. That again is absurd given the fact that many people in the developing world do not have and cannot afford to have a sedentary lifestyle. They work quite hard for a living, even housewives often cover long distances with heavy loads of water on their heads carrying to their uh, dwellings. And, of course, people are rickshaw drivers, they're workers in agriculture and construction, so they use many more calories than I would use, and I'm a paradigm example of somebody with a sedentary lifestyle. The third element of the definition of the FAO is that you have to be below that threshold of the minimum needs of a sedentary lifestyle, 1,800 kilocalories, for over a year. And I think it's worthwhile looking at the justification the FAO gives for that condition. So 11 months of being under the threshold, you don't count as undernourished if it's only 11 months. Here is the, oh, I've already said this, these are the three elements of the definition. Here's the justification. The reference period should be long enough for the consequences of low food intake to be detrimental to health. Although there is no doubt that temporary food shortage may be stressful, may be stressful, the FAO indicator is based on a full year. Now, hearing that from the FAO, the organization charged with trying to get everybody to be well nourished in this world, is really quite disheartening. But this is, I think, what you get if you allow agencies like that who are subject to pressure by governments to engage in the definition of what undernourishment is and in the counting of the undernourished. But if I were an official of one of these organizations, and if governments came to me, governments were appointing my top officers and are giving me my budget, I might also be tempted to 
give the, the few numbers if they ask for them and to beautify the trend. But I think we as citizens, if we want a full picture of what's really happening in the world, we should insist on independent agents, uh, expert committees doing that kind of work. Uh, the Earth Institute would be capable of doing it. There would be plenty of people in the academic world who would be able to put together a credible measurement effort and one that would be no more expensive than what the FAO and the World Bank are doing. So that's the third critique. <coughs> the fourth critique, and I'll stop with that for reasons of time, is that there should be a clear and firm commitment to inequality reduction. Now you will say, well, don't we have that, right? We have goals 10, uh, which NGOs have worked very hard to get into the SDGs, and it wasn't the MDGs, which speaks about inequality reduction, but look at what it actually <coughs> says under target 10.1. What it says is by 2030, progressively achieve and sustain income growth of the bottom 40% of the population at a rate higher than the national average. So I'm very happy with the bottom 40% growing at a rate that is higher than the national average. What I'm unhappy about is that that is supposed to begin before 2030. In other words, if that begins in 2029, that's just fine. So I think that for uh, many reasons, we should at the very least aim for inequality in 2030, that is below the level of 2015, rather than allowing inequality to rise another 14 years and then peak in 2029 and decline from there. So these are the main points that I wanted to make. Thank you. Thank you, um, and thank you so much for um, organizing Raymond and the entire team that's helped pull this together. It's um, great to be here, and I think we are gathered um, at an auspicious moment for the topic at hand. Um, I come at this with a particular focus on sustainable development, energy, environment, and related issues, and it's been an extraordinary couple of months, and as Jeff Sachs hinted at in the last session, uh, in another one there will be a, a further major step uh, on the path, perhaps, towards uh, a sustainable future. Um, in terms of auspicious elements, uh, I think uh, the visit of the Pope to the United States, and frankly, the Pope's stepping into the sustainable development uh, debate, and his uh, Laudato Si um, encyclical on care of our common home, has spurred a focus on what I think are the two critical issues uh, if we're really to move forward on sustainability and to deliver on the promise of the Sustainable Development Goals. And I take this um, identification of two critical elements from an extensive work uh, in the business world, where I have spent a lot of time over the last decade understanding what sustainability might mean in the business world and understanding how that might translate back into sustainability in the policy domain. And I do that because I think the 20th century approach to policy uh, in terms of advancing sustainability has turned out to be extremely disappointing. Um, I think the business world has actually made more progress. So here, after surveying dozens and dozens of articles and business literature, are the two things that almost everyone agrees are critical to corporate success generally, and frankly to corporate sustainability in particular. And they are vision, and execution. Uh, and I think, frankly, we have been lacking on both fronts, and the argument I want to make to you all today is that the Sustainable Development Goals offer progress on both vision and execution uh, as a policy guide. Uh, I think the Pope has provided us with extraordinary vision, and I think the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, although <laughs> Thomas's critique is to be taken seriously, help to sharpen our focus on a set of issues that need to be understood, need to be addressed, uh, the connections across them need to be uh, analyzed, and an appreciation of the need for an integrated policy response taken more seriously. But I think we do have, with these SDGs, a starting point for a more coherent policy.
policy strategy in the 21st century. I am less optimistic about execution. And in fact, if you ask me for my fundamental critique for us on a ramped up trajectory on climate change, which uh, I believe, and I think a number of you in this room might believe, is the critical issue in many regards for delivering on the promise of a sustainable future. So at the, in the spring of 1992, I want to take you back to that moment. Uh, I was a young official with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency leading the team that was negotiating uh, the Framework Convention on Climate Change. And I remember distinctly being taken aside by the uh, Secretary General of that UN Conference on Environment and Development, the Rio Earth Summit of 1992, a Canadian guy named Morris Strong. And Morris Strong said to me, Dan, you've got to remember one thing. When we bring together 100 plus presidents and prime ministers and all their supporting ministers and thousands of NGOs and thousands of media people, only two outcomes are possible. Success and real success. And I have to tell you, the intervening 23 years has been a lot of real success, lacking and claimed success as the mode of operation. So I think the core of our 21st century strategy has to get us beyond claims of success and into understanding what really drives action and real success. Uh, and by the way, the 2009 Conference of the Parties to the Framework Convention on Climate Change in Copenhagen proved more a strong wrong. A failure is an option. And I think that 2009 attempt to seal the deal on a new climate change, which people claim success in Copenhagen, but within days, not even weeks, the claim of success had fallen apart, remains a possibility coming out of Paris. Uh, so I do think we're at a very critical juncture on whether the world community's focus on climate change and commitment to a trajectory that will really ramp up the global response uh, is swinging in the balance over the next month. So here's my analysis. Of what went wrong in the 20th century, and as you'll see, the Sustainable Development Goals offer a path, I think, uh, forward in responding to a number of these, but not all of these points. Uh, number one, we focused almost entirely on a top-down strategy. Uh, it was a nation-state to nation-state conversation centered on targets and timetables meant to be implemented country by country uh, in most countries with some structure <coughs> of 20th century-like command and control regulation mandates. Um, I think that has proven to be uh, disappointing almost across the board and that our 21st century strategy needs to be quite different. Uh, again, I think the idea that setting targets and timetables, you'll remember the Framework Convention on Climate Change was to reduce in the year 2000 uh, greenhouse gas emissions to 99 levels. That was the goal. Almost every country failed. Uh, trivia question of the day, what three countries succeeded? Well, number one was Russia. And what was the model of success? Collapse in the economy, yes, thank you very much. Not a good policy strategy to sell broadly. Uh, who else succeeded? Number two was the UK. How did Britain do it? Fuel switching. They shut coal mines and moved to natural gas as the base of their energy system. Uh, and the third country that succeeded was, of course, Germany, that did half the Russian model, collapsing the East German economy, and half the British model, shutting coal mines and switching to natural gas. Um, it turns out that everybody else missed. And when I say everybody else, that brings me to the second point about what was wrong with the strategy. We made a huge error, an error so big I consider it the worst policy error of my life, although I was a junior person and couldn't really be held responsible for this gigantic error, not only of US policy, but of the global strategy. And that was to divide the world into two groups, a list of Annex I countries that had responsibility to bring down emissions, and a non-Annex I list of everybody else that was invited to sit on the sidelines. And frankly, a significant number of countries did sit on the sidelines for now two decades plus, and that was the fundamental disaster of that framework convention on climate change. Um, because the sitting on the sidelines of all those countries has provided the political excuse in the United States for inaction. Because every time there's a debate in Congress, a huge swath of the Congress, and by the way, it's now increasing with just Republicans, but in the early days, it was all the Democrats as well as the Republicans who voted at one time nearly unanimously for something called the Byrd-Hagel 
amendment or resolution which said the U.S. would not take action on climate change until developing countries, particularly our competitors in trade, were asked to do the same. So the division of the world into two halves, a giant disaster. It was a failed interpretation of a justice principle, the principle of common but differentiated responsibility. And frankly, this idea that the differentiatedness should overwhelm the commonness was a mistake, just an outright error and one that we are, I think, about to fix, which is really critical. But I would say there was an alternative approach at that time in 92 that we should have gotten right. So people look back and say, Dan, don't be so hard on yourself. It can't have been uh, that obvious. The alternative approach to burden sharing, which is what we're talking about, was what was done in the Montreal Protocol as we took down the fluorofluorocarbons, CFCs, that were breaking down the ozone layer. We did not divide the world into two halves. We graded the countries and said the leaders should move quickly to phase out these emissions. The developing world doesn't sit on the sidelines, but they get extra time to achieve the phase out. And to other points, they get money. We provide support. But beyond that, those that balk are threatened with trade penalties for not participating in the global responsibility of addressing a challenge to our common planet. So it was carrots and sticks and time, not the division of the world into two halves, that I think was the right model. Third mistake, uh, fundamental mistake, was to think that we could finance the transition to a clean energy future with government money. Um, and I heard some people say earlier that there is hope for the Green Climate Fund. I don't have any hope for the Green Climate Fund. The energy sector of global society is a sixth trillion dollar a year business. How much money has been pledged to the Green Climate Fund? Another cocktail party question of the day. Does anyone know? Something approximating 10 billion against a six trillion dollar element of society. 10 billion over three years. Uh, thank you, over three years, including three billion of the United States money, which will never appear given the Congress we have in the United States. So we are now talking of something more like two billion per year against a six trillion, seven trillion dollar global structure. So the thought that you could steer the world towards a clean energy future with a green climate fund, deeply misguided. We need a different strategy, and frankly, it applies in the domestic context as well as the global one. And that is the government role can't be to be the investor in clean energy. It needs to be the guide and the de-risker of private capital flowing into the transformative investments needed to bring out renewable energy sources, greater energy efficiency, restructuring of our model of electricity distribution, moving away from a big grid to distributed generation, and a fundamental rethinking of the energy future of this country and frankly of the world. And so I would argue that we should not put a lot of stock in a green climate fund, but really should, and this is where the SDGs are not fully structured, be thinking about how we gauge whether we are moving towards structuring a world where government intervention will help guide private capital into the investments that need to be made. And I think that, again, is what really needs to be tracked um, as we move forward. And um, you know, I think, uh, just to close this out and then move on, um, one other thing that we know is critical is that developing countries should not think that they have an excuse because of promises unkept to do nothing. Um, and Jeff, I, I hope I didn't hear you say that. You did say that there were promises unkept. I think that, that one has to be careful in that regard. I think um, in some countries, the United States, there is a belief that there are not promises unkept. I believe the United States did not sign up for, uh, in any fix and hard way, uh, a number of these commitments to provide uh, developing country support. So I think we have to be careful um, it, because in the United States, that remains a sticking point and a point of debate. And in any case, I think it is important for developing countries to appreciate that they have some responsibility as well to make themselves um, attractive to what will be the much bigger flow of capital from private sources. And a number of countries have done this and have succeeded brilliantly. Uh, South Korea, China, Chile, Mexico, just to name some, that have attracted tens of billions of dollars uh, and have begun in that regard to transform their energy futures. 
So the 21st century model, I think, needs to get us beyond a focus on targets and timetables um, to a focus on action. Um, only a lawyer would think that signing a treaty with a target, or for that matter, passing a law or writing a regulation, is <coughs> doing the job. And again, I was guilty of that in the early 1990s. Anyone in business would understand that's like writing a mission statement. You then need an implementation strategy, a commitment to action and execution that is much bigger and more enduring than the setting of a target. Second, we need to um, be very clear that the conversation can't just be nation state to nation state. It turns out that presidents and prime ministers have very limited impact uh, on a day-to-day -day basis over the carbon footprints of their society. Uh, we need a broader strategy of engagement uh, to deliver on a climate change issue, but also more broadly on sustainable development. Recognizing that a lot of the critical decisions are made by mayors, governors, or premiers, or other sub-national political leaders, and for that matter, CEOs and corporate executives, and civil society institutions as well. So we need to get away from that top-down strategy and really build a parallel, bottom-up commitment to action. I think we need, as I said, to recast, at least in the climate context, but I would argue more broadly, uh, this core burden-sharing principle of common but differentiated responsibility to focus much more on the common element of that and not the differentiated element. Of course we're going to have a different strategy, and we need to have not just a world divided into two, but gradations. That South Korea sits in the no obligation under climate change category is a joke. Um, and that Chile would, not fair either. So let's have a strategy that the fastest running goes to the furthest ahead. There's a second tier of countries that are now emerging economies that should still have significant obligations and go down to very modest expectations among the least developed countries. Uh, and I think that's a much better foundation for global justice in climate change and more broadly on sustainable development challenges. Uh, and again, I think credit to the Pope. Um, his Laudato Si is on care of our common home, emphasize common and a shared responsibility. He doesn't have a, a, a parenthetical, oh, by the way, it's a very big differentiation as to who's going to have to do what. And yet, of course, he does say that. But I think emphasize our common commitment to a common goal. I do think we need a new finance model. Uh, I think the scale of investment required, the diversity of investments in new energy options uh, is something governments are not good at. We need a much broader array of commitments from the private sector. And finally, I would say the 21st century needs to be much more focused on the opportunities that didn't exist 25 years ago to use data and metrics like the SDGs to provide a framework for progress. Um, I think that the SDGs actually can be understood as both providing vision. Thomas has argued perhaps not enough ambition, but I think on a number of issues, they are providing us a direction to go, which is very helpful. And more than people have appreciated a strategy for gauging execution. Um, it allows us to figure out, if done right, who's leading, who's lagging, to create some sense of competition, to allow us to identify best practices and disseminate those, uh, which I think we want to do. And I think it also provides us um, with a ability to understand the drivers of success through further analysis. Um, once we figure out who's leading and why, we can then go back and understand if there are uh, further policy changes that need to be done. Now, I do think that our existing framework of data, which is in the backdrop of the SDGs, is inadequate and fundamentally so in some important categories. Uh, Thomas, thank you for taking apart the FAO's uh, response to the issue of hunger. I thought that was extremely well done. Um, I have been working for 15 years now on something we call our Yale Columbia Environmental Performance Index. It had a prior structure as an environmental sustainability index. It is a gauge of uh, nation state scale success in meeting uh, 20 different metrics of environmental performance, some of which relate to environmental public health, another set of which relate to ecosystem vitality. What we've learned in the course of doing this is that whole swaths of critical policy areas have very poor data. 
There's lots of water data in the world, very little that is actually comparable, methodologically consistent across the world. It would allow you to understand which countries are doing a good job protecting surface waters, protecting groundwater, providing drinking water, ensuring that the commitment of sanitation, which the SDGs highlight as the Millennium Development Goals did prior to that, is really making progress. Um, and we, it, it's shocking how much of this existing data is modeled, not measured on the ground, is not measured consistently, not verified, not cross-checked. And frankly, there are whole countries that just report what the five-year plan said the result would be without actually <coughs> getting in to understanding whether the data is real and workable as a policy framework. So I think we're at a moment of opportunity and challenge where we have a 21st century policy vision that I think is actually quite promising, but we need to bring a firmer foundation of data and metrics in order to ensure that the SDGs can be fleshed out and provide us with both a strategy of vision on where we need to go as a global community and on a gauge on execution, whether we're doing the job we need to do to make change happen on the ground, which is where we really need to measure it. Thank you very much. significance is not easy. The world works uh, the way it does for reasons, for interests, for structures, for incentives, for technological reasons, and so forth. And a decision to move in a different direction is inherently a very complicated project. Whose decision? We have 7.3 billion people in we have 193 member states of the United Nations. We have tens of thousands of major businesses. We have, therefore, a, we have uh, very different views about reality uh, on the planet. Uh, we have people killing each other uh, every day uh, because of uh, their differences of views. So the idea that somehow humanity in a meaningful sense, can choose a future is itself an extraordinary idea, and that's what we're trying to do. I would argue that these processes internationally uh, have been extremely important, but the challenge of operating on a global scale at a relevant time frame is very, very difficult. And so what's needed is a constructive oar in the water to help pull in an effective way and adding new tools as our most important uh, motivation and organizational principle. And we at universities have a major role to play in constructively adding to this kind of problem solving. There isn't going to be another kind of problem solving by the way, whatever you want to have workshops and seminars, that's fine. But these are the only goals we're going to have globally agreed for several years to come. We're not going to have another framework convention on climate change, possibly ever, uh, because uh, we've got one and it was hard enough to achieve. And the challenge of implementing it is very, very real. And whether we do or not is a matter of years and decades. So practically speaking, we have a framework that we need to make work better. So we should understand what's effective and ineffective in the way these very difficult processes work. First, I've been uh, with the Millennium Development Goals every day for the last 15 years. They've made a positive difference on a very difficult challenge. 
which is to draw the world's attention to the world's poorest people and to have something done about it. And in that regard, uh, I would strongly argue that they've made a positive difference on what is not intrinsically an easy topic. The world does not care generally about very poor people. The world's media, the world's politics, the world's markets, the world's businesses are not exactly focused on the world's poorest people. And on the paper that brought me here, I wanted to model mergers and acquisitions and statistic and strategic acquisitions and divestments. I wanted to know what sectors are being expended by the largest multinationals overseas. And Dun and Bradstreet said that they contributed the world where the wonderful uh, price that they told you is ten thousand dollars for MDC acquisitions. So how can we incentivize more data collection, more data being available, and what particular organizations can we talk to? I'll go first and we'll let Jeff follow. Um, I think that uh, there are ongoing challenges and opportunities um, when it comes to data improvement. The biggest challenge I've seen is that if data collection, and, and I, I, by the way, thought Jeff said something very important in the end, which is the UN still is a place where ideals um, uh, are uplifted, and I, I think we should celebrate that. I also would, though, note that the UN has particular challenges when it comes to execution, which I've argued is, alongside vision, um, critical. And in particular, on data, um, the UN and, frankly, the World Bank as well has a problem, which is that when countries don't like some of the numbers that are coming into a global data set, they can push back. Um, and I think it may well be and this now flips from challenged opportunity, it may well be that we shouldn't count on the UN to do the global data collection, and that what we've got today is a world of additionally empowered potential institutions, and that we should look to um, some coalition or, or, or uh, aggregation of universities to do the data collection. Um, I think you could also think of uh, some role of NGOs, although it would be important that they be analytically rigorous entities committed to getting the data right. Um, and I think we have to scope that out. But I also think there's a potential in two other directions that we should put down markers for and watch. One is that in a big data world, it could be you could crowdsource some of this data and get to uh, better numbers simply by having enough people checking each other um, that the issue of validation can be overcome. Second, um, I think there's a possibility that this can be done through corporate reporting, because a lot of the data is known by corporations and um, I think there's a growing pressure in the investment world to have companies report against a structured and methodologically consistent set of uh, environment and sustainability metrics. And so that I have some hope for as well. But I think the, the getting of a core data set, even on critical issues like water, where we have lots of data but nothing that's comparable and therefore really worth uh, using in an analytically rigorous framework, is, is a challenge. I think. Uh, this is uh, exactly right. The, um, in all of these areas, first, I would start with your starting point. What should be collected? Uh, so if the, uh, if, if the water scientists say we should be collecting VOD, this, this, and this, and these are the critical values, a consensus on that, even within a country, but certainly globally, makes a huge difference. Second, <coughs> then, is mechanisms. <coughs> mechanisms of collection. We now have the capacity to collect data that is orders of magnitude improved compared to a generation ago. And even in, say, China with the, the air pollution crisis, which is a highly charged political crisis, the daily ambient air conditions are online, real time, everywhere in a, in a thousand, uh, I think a thousand monitoring stations right now. And they go immediately online. And there was a wonderful paper just produced in Science or Nature a week or two ago using these data over the last four month period to estimate what are the sources for the, uh, what was it, uh, nitrous oxide, I think. Uh, Soxes and oxes, and, and uh, with a very uh, detailed modeling. So that's China. China's not 
exactly the most open country in the world in terms of some of the data, and yet this is real-time, online, uh, very high-quality data. We need to make world observation like this on many different values. I can guarantee you the UN cannot do that and will not do that. Uh, what the UN could do is help to facilitate it, but the knowledge of what to do will not come from within. There isn't even a water organization in the UN, per se, so it makes it even harder to do this because there's nobody particularly in charge of water quality in the UN. You have a little bit. But none of these organizations has the capacity to do that or even to know what can be done. So my view is, again, theory of change is epistemic communities need to lead. And that means trusted, trustworthy experts that are unimpeachable by other experts. If you can form a consensus on that, it's very, very powerful. And in the end, even on climate, where you're contesting the most powerful vested interest in the whole world, which is the oil industry, it's the single biggest industry in our whole world economy for decades, the science is winning in the end because it's true. Uh, and it's step-by-step, uh, step. it's also convincing the world's population. But the organizational effort that had to go into saying, what is the science? How does it work? What does it show? This whole structure of the IPCC was an invention to bring the science to the attention of the world when it's so complicated and so easily distorted by propaganda and by corporate messaging. And it's working. So bottom line on this, of course, we need much more uh, sophisticated data systems. We need crowdsourcing. We're going to have, starting next year, daily satellite readings of the whole planet through the low Earth orbital satellite systems. And there are going to be several commercial companies putting this up. Every day, you'll be able to know the rainfall, not with weather stations, but directly. You'll be able to know a tremendous amount about vegetative cover, drought, that means floods, disasters, and so forth. What we can do with this is absolutely phenomenal. Right now, the only ones that get this are the National Intelligence Agency, basically. And we need to bring this into the world of development. The World Bank does not have in-house the expertise for this. The people who know how to do this is the global scientific community. And they need to speak coherently, not in journal articles of writing, fighting each other, but actually as a world community saying, this is what we need to measure and why, and use the SDGs as a political lever. <coughs> you see, you said you want clean water, but you can't measure it except the following way. Yeah, so I would just add that it depends on what data they are, and you already mentioned that data about the poor are not very much collected. And the other thing is that obviously with like some data, they're vested for their villages. That's the point Dan made, that countries have an interest in what is reported about them, and they often push back about data that are reported on them. And with regard to the uh, poverty data, what also matters is uh, the definition, right? I mean, you said we are aiming now for zero poverty. That's true, but we are aiming for zero poverty relative to a poverty line that I would not recognize as uh, defining anything like a reasonable point of having escaped poverty, $1.25 or $1.90 in 2011 dollars. That's still you know, very, very poor, as you can easily try out by trying to live on $1.90 per day in this country today. So we, uh, I think what we should do is think about the definition and the measurement together and indicate that interest is here primarily with regard to poverty eradication, deprivation, and eradication. The academic route seems to me to be the best. So this year we have a Nobel Prize winner, Angus Eaton, who is a great data man, uh, has worked a lot about poverty, hunger, and things like that. I would say that him put together an expert team to find a reasonable standard of poverty or hunger and then uh, find ways of measuring and implementing that standard within the resources that are now being spent by the World Bank and the World Health Organization. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you so much for three very inspiring uh, talks. Uh, I, I need to ask this question. Uh, so we're talking about uh, guiding action, we're talking about the uh, conference of Paris, and I really need to ask about carbon pricing. So it might not sound like the most sexy idea, but seems to me that is one that is capable of guiding action. It's precisely because, uh, well, we don't really need to uh, agree on a global carbon price, or perhaps at least not right now. So I want to know, uh, is it an idea that really can guide action? And is it something, to what extent do we need a global agreement on that? Or what kind of agreement would, you need, would, would we need on, on carbon pricing? So I, um, I want to step back and reinforce something Jeff said earlier, which is I've just come out of three years in government running Connecticut's Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. And people ask me, so what did you learn? Or what was the most striking thing you learned? And it's this, that change is really hard to deliver even when the status quo is completely and plainly not working. So I think the logic of a carbon price, which from a policy point of view is blindingly obvious, um, becomes a challenge when politics, uh, both nationally and globally, uh, have to be the mediating force to get that done. Which is why I have come to believe that the vision of the 20th century, and it was not just in the framework convention on climate change of 1992, but the broader environmental vision of top-down, federal, national, uniform strategies and rules is difficult to carry forward and at any point in the 21st century, even within a country, even more so across countries. So I actually favor um, targets in common and delivery strategies uh, in a differentiated basis. And I would like to see a common price target. I think a price target on carbon is much better than an emissions target. So I would like to see, and I've written this up in a piece with Mike Porter at Harvard Business School, um, a goal of establishing, out 20 years from now, $100 a ton carbon price. And I would start at $5 a ton and move it up by $5 a ton per year for 20 years. And I would allow countries to implement uh, against that common target in any way that they might choose. So Europe might continue to use its emissions trading scheme and refine that. Um, Connecticut might continue to use the regional greenhouse gas uh, structure that's in place, uh, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, or REGI. And you know, Texas might have to pick something else, because I'm not even sure we can get a common theme in the United States. So I would go for uh, globally set common targets. And by the way, shifting from an emissions target to a price target, I think is the possible and, and, and good thing to do. And then provide for great flexibility in how people get there. And I am also willing to have the time frame on which people get to the ultimate target vary, with you know Europe going much faster to the full hundred dollar a ton price, you know, poor countries much slower. That sounds good. <laughs> uh, you know, I think the idea is clear goals, clear targets, clear timetables but a lot of decentralization and how they're actually achieved is important. And that's local responsibility as well as local context. And it is why I think a kind of copy and vision makes sense, which is you're each responsible for this. This is, uh, you're each acting according to uh, individual actions that could become the, the general principle, um, but allowing for the uh, local context if you really want to get this job done. If you go the other way, which was the original, I think, dream in, of some people uh, in Europe in particular, that we're going to have a global trading scheme, it, it obviously it was not a very accurate idea to begin with. Institutionally, it was very naive, and obviously it didn't happen. Uh, and it didn't happen for reasons we can now analyze and say, uh, let's figure out a more practical approach. So having said that, a carbon price is a kind of advocacy. It, it's a kind of tool that meets the test of being sensible, 
analytical, rigorously justifiable, uh, and decentralizable uh, in that you don't even have to say everyone has the same price. Let's not argue about that right now. Many uh, have a negative price on carbon, of course. That's the first starting point, is that there still are hundreds of billions of dollars in subsidies of CO2 exploration, development, and use. And so that's not even getting to zero yet. And then above that, understanding that, and by the way, the reason why this is also perfectly practicable is that many, many major companies, including most of the oil companies, already have a price on carbon in their internal books, not on what they report to the tax authorities or what they pay out to shareholders, but in terms of their internal calculations, Shell and Exxon and others are already using an internal price on carbon, um, which shows that they know analytically something like that's on its way. So Alex, if I can just add one other thing, the, the uh, additional point is that I think economists have been terribly frustrated because the price strategy seems so obvious. Um, and I think what um, it's going to take is some softening of the environmental community to ensure that a quantity target was better than a price target. I think the other thing the environmental community has to uh, rethink, and, and frankly, changing the environmental community is as hard as in any other community, um, is that we have an urgent problem that has to be fixed this year or next. You know, I just laid out a 20-year price escalation, which a lot of environmentalists have trouble with. But it turns out that the ability to get that phased in slowly, but on a clear schedule, is enormously valuable. For the reason that Jeff just suggested, in part because those who are invested deeply in a current structure of infrastructure based on a different set of pricing of energy options need time to write down their existing uh, investments and 20 years is about the time on which everybody should be able to flip over. The other thing you get with this phase-in is that anyone making a new investment starts looking at the 20-year price immediately for any investment that's 20, 30, 40, or 50 years, not the first-year price. So in year one and year two, you get a very small economic dislocation, but any new decision is looking at the 20-year, $100 a ton price. So you get upfront the benefit of, of driving future planning and low political backlash. So one of the things, again, I think we need to think about is how we get from big dreams to deliverable results. And that policy strategy, I think, actually has some elements to it that are extremely helpful in that regard. optimism uh, that we're looking at Paris uh, as we speak. We don't know, obviously, but there is a certain optimism. And meanwhile, we saw you know, USA and China sitting down and, and doing, we saw mayors, governors, we saw banks, we saw oil companies having initiatives, pension funds, hedge funds, uh, disinvestment in, in fossil fuels. We even saw reports from right wings, not particular ecologist people saying, no, we have to act. And I'd like to know, what is your opinion? How do you come from 2009 to today? Is it just an idea, constructivist, uh, saying that, oh, this idea became a social norm? Or is it something else, like a process or a structure or an incentive? Uh, and if yes, the second case, which ones uh, that caused this, this switch in five years? When 2009 failed, uh, actually a yes piece, um, the finance piece that Jeff mentioned, I think does require some uh, shifting of gears. And, and the truth is you can't shift gears completely. So although I'm saying it's time to really go from a, a government-centered strategy to a private sector-centered strategy, um, there will always be a need for some funding from uh, governments. And I think whether we're going to get there remains open. I'm also optimistic, though, that um, we are going to see the 2015 Paris Agreement do much more with big data, with metrics, with new strategies of reporting, uh, building on the so-called Nazca platform to give not just national governments, but these mayors and governors and premiers and CEOs a place to register their commitment to action. And frankly, over time, we can build that out into a reporting and tracking strategy 
uh, that allows us to figure out what's working and what's not, what best practices look like. So I, I think there's some substantive changes that are emerging in the Paris Agreement that give optimism uh, a, a bit of logic, despite what Jeff correctly points out as some ongoing and tough issues still to resolve. So I had one downside, which is that we've lost six precious years. And that means that <laughs> not only for six years did the upward trajectory continue, but this also adds a good bit of carbon to all the future years. We now peak later, you peak at a higher level, and so I think we are, given the numbers that Kira and I pointed out at the beginning, we are still in deep trouble, even if the hoped for agreement comes about in Paris. Well, that's a bit trivial, but we are getting into time trouble. I we have 10 minutes left, and I have five people. So to the six people on my list, my proposal is the following. The five people, it's Tenkai, it's you, it's Lisa, Nora, and Anna, and then it's additionally you. You ask short questions, we listen, and then we have some concluding remarks from our speakers. So, Tenkai. Okay, so, you. Uh, but turning the steering wheel, what would you assess to be the relevance of a potential democratization of global institutions? Like counterfactual, if global institutions that might steer the wheel would have more adequate democratic representation of the global population, would that have implications for the goals or for the possibilities to execute them? And on the conductorless orchestra. I was thinking about feminist debates on structureless organizations in the 60s, and there was a very good criticism of tyranny of structurelessness, assuming that there's no nobody in charge means that it prevents you from devising mechanisms for adequate representation. To what extent is there tyranny of uh, conductorlessness, <coughs> and to what extent is that metaphor open to similar criticism that was made to the structurelessness thing? This one? Um, I was just not upset worried about the same kinds of things. So I was struck by the comment that um, it's very hard to change the status quo even when the status quo is not working. Um, and uh, so I thought to myself, well, uh, if the status quo is not working, for the world as a whole, but there is a very small percentage of people who are perfectly happy with things exactly how they are. Uh, and so uh, for the 1%, things are peachy. So that why would, you know, why would they, those people who are, have disproportionate resources and disproportionate power, especially in the US political, uh, on the US political system, um, uh, why would they, why would they not stand in you know in the way? And so I guess uh, my real question is: to what extent is you know the sort of crazy level of global wealth inequality um, keeping us stuck in the status quo? Thank you. Um, this is I think more of a comment, and it was just to say I was really struck by the argument that um, inaction is is immoral. This idea that we shouldn't just um, just sort of watch the inevitability of what's going on and not do anything, and it made me think about this problem of, of how you motivate democratic involvement. Um, I was thinking of um, recently Habermas has written about uh, this problem of a secular society being unable to motivate it, its citizens for democratic involvement, and he's began to see that actually there is a, a role for these sort of more civil society groups, particularly even religious groups, to to at the um, sort of from the bottom up provide moral motivation, and it could come from you know inspirational leadership, um, vision, but also implementation through people actually being motivated to act. And so it's been very refreshing on this panel to hear some of those perspectives from whether it's religious groups or other civil society. Of, of not just that this 
quickly as trying to, to come up with a concrete proposal how to avoid the misuse of this data because the danger seems to be very clear and obvious with regard to privacy violations and the individuals, but also with regard to some to very strong power asymmetry of information and which can often affect groups and societies in the future. And then how worried should we be about the uh, conflicts? Frictions uh, between the US and China over the South China Sea Islands to create more problems for China US cooperation and addressing climate change. The other question is with the focus in the US on fracking, and I understand there are some forces pushing fracking even in China, also with that strategy of oil overproduction, global oil overproduction and cheap oil. How can we address these things so that they don't take away from the need to continue to source or remove globally and especially in poor countries? Institutions. The first issue is relative weight of, uh, of developing countries and developed countries. So I don't know whether that's called democratization of global institutions or not. That's a term that could mean lots of different things. Uh, but uh, increasing weight of uh, increasing vote of uh, developing countries in Bretton Woods institutions has been on hold since 2010. Uh, and the uh, role of uh, Asia in general in the UN Security Council is uh, very underrepresented. So there are a lot of issues of reform of the international institutions which reflect the 1945 US uh, preeminence uh, in making these institutions. And that's where a lot of change has to be of course, there are a lot of other complexities. Uh, a general assembly is not a representative. It's, it's representative in a certain sense, in the formal sense of one vote, one nation. But it gives Tonga <coughs> the same role as China in the general assembly. That's problematic, in my view. Yeah, I, don't, I, I wouldn't reduce global democratization to one country, one vote. No, no, no. I, I, don't, I know you wouldn't. I'm just saying that these are all very difficult questions of, uh, of global governance. So what the terms mean and, and, uh, and uh, what, what they imply is, is a big issue. In my view, the most important uh, issues are immediately rebalancing votes within the Bretton Woods institutions and second, a reform of the UN Security Council, which I regard as way overdue and extremely important. And it's very important because the Security Council is vital for global peace. And if it's not seen as a legitimate uh, institution that is representative, we lose a tremendous amount. So that's where I would put the most important, uh, most important emphasis at the start. Uh, on uh, the conductorless uh, orchestra, I personally believe in this model of uh, trying to find clear shared goals and then in a highly decentralized way trying to achieve them through a mix of advocacy, interstate relations, uh, self-action, uh, and so on. I'm not sure that I see a different model and a big role of epistemic communities in helping to uh, explain what are our real options in this. Uh, I like a Kantian framework or a moral framework around this uh, more generally to say that uh, we have global goals because this is for the common good and the common home. And however you phrase it, whether it's as a Kantian imperative or whether you phrase it as 
Pope Francis did as a common plan for our common home. Morality has this basic underlying structure that there are a few, uh, that it's a common interest and, and it's a shared interest and it's a, under a sense of equality uh, and a, a perspective that's not any individual perspective. And I think that that's the right starting point. But then to implement, it's very complicated, but we should learn to implement in a conductorless-like way. But that's why timetables, targets, I love them because that's what can keep us moving in a particular direction. But it's a fragile, difficult process, uh, and, uh, and we need to, uh, need to learn how to make the process work. I think the 1% approach is helpful in explaining certain things and not in other things about the difficulties of change certainly helps to explain U.S. politics in certain dimensions. Uh, from a rigorous analytical point of view, we have plenty of evidence that that's a good explanation for how public policy is uh, decided in this country in certain ways. And so it's an alert about how to organize and act and so on. It's not really a full explanation for why we haven't reached a climate agreement earlier. Uh, it, it's not only the top 1% or even the oil industry in this country that have done it in the most powerful interests. It's all of the things we've been talking about. So I wouldn't have a theory of change that's just dependent on that one element, uh, although it's an important one in certain contexts. And I think just like all the complex systems, ideas that we're talking about, understanding the tyranny of the status quo has to introduce political elements, technological, ecological, psychological, ideological reasons. And these are hard issues also. And when you're saying, okay, we know we have to move, but where should we move? That introduces a different kind of discussion, not only of interest, but of analysis. Now, we've just gone through a 20-year seminar on climate change for the world. I think we've come out more or less all right. The only problem with it is <laughs> you, we don't have the luxury of time. So that's the problem. But if we did have the luxury of time, you would say, God, that was great. We've just been through four rounds of analysis. Now we have the global understanding around most of the world that this is real, serious, and so on. It's just this damn problem of physics that means that we have a, a tighter time horizon than our normal learning curve in a classroom of 7.3 billion people. So I think that that's, the theory of change includes the 1%, but not only the 1%. On the role of uh, moral leaders, civil society, without question, uh, and this is a, a long uh, point about social change, what causes it, how is it brought about. The only thing I would add to this is, um, among obvious points, and moral leaders, uh, very complicated topic. We need them. Uh, they can easily uh, be, uh, demagogues can masquerade uh, in that way, and have throughout history. I'd like us to keep grounded in uh, in science and in fact, and therefore I think one part of our theory of change has to be the very strong role of knowledge communities. And that is a different part of this kind of change. It's also not easy because our knowledge communities are not organized that way uh, often. And so that that is just the part that I would add. On the misuse of data, uh, Almost every technology that we have has two sides to it. Uh, and we've seen not, not to get the pure good on almost any choices that we have. Um, and big data is just the latest of these. It's very dangerous, big data. Uh, I don't like all my private information sold by Google, Google to the highest bidder, but I know that it is. I don't really know what to do about that myself, uh, but it's a problem. And this is a real problem with data. 
on the other hand, having it can make our world a lot safer if it's used in the right way. Uh, but this is a trivial observation. I would say the same thing with nuclear power, with GMOs, and with many other things. I tend to believe these technologies are all needed, but they are all <coughs> dangerous. That's why I believe that uh, it's never right to say that technology is the solution to the problems. That's always wrong. But it is always a good idea to say technology together with a moral framework uh, and a legal framework is helpful. Because not one of the things that we're talking about can be solved unless we do, uh, unless we mobilize some of uh, this information. So, final point I would say, when you're dealing with problem solving in complex systems, generally you need relatively complex answers. And so the answer has to be data plus something. And when you're dealing with complex answers, any individual component by itself is insufficient and potentially dangerous. So saying we need A, B, and C may be the truth. And saying we need A may say, but A could lead to disaster uh, unless it's combined with B and C. That, I think, is our existential reality, actually, uh, which is that we need answers that are more complicated than simple answers. And that makes all of this quite, quite hard. Uh, on the final point about uh, US-China conflicts and so forth, I would put it in the simple way. If we have a new Cold War, we will not solve these other problems or a hot war. If we have a hot war, we don't even have, uh, we better, if we have a hot war, uh, forget everything. Uh, if we have a cold war and high tensions, none of these problems is going to be solved because they all require a high degree of cooperation. And the blightness with, with which we want to confront China or do this or do that, this is really absurd. If we're facing more conflict, it means we need more dialogue. We need to intensify the cooperative institutions, not just have showdowns. He is a trained killer. He's very good, so that's his job. But don't ask him about politics, for God's sake. His job is trained to kill. That's his literal job. But thank God we supposedly have civilian control over the military because that's not the solution to almost anything. So he wanted more confrontations here, 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 and here. And if you care about the problems we're talking about today, that would completely end the possibility of solving any of these problems. Uh, should I do one minute, I can go last? So I'll just speak to a couple of the points. Um, I think the, uh, the world working for the 1% um, is true in terms of their economic results. I think the biggest challenge of that is the political torque that it results in. But I think the, the one percenters face the same uh, cliff that Jeff Sachs described earlier, uh, at least their children and grandchildren do. And I think a growing number of them are starting to worry about it. So I, I think the political torque is a worry. I, think, um, I don't think the, the, the current scene, the status quo, serves their purposes out of our time very well at all. Um, with regard to China, let me just add to Jeff's point, I think um, there are lots of elements to the U.S.-China relationship. I am actually not so worried about whether China is going to back away from its climate change commitments because I think most of those are related to Chinese domestic logic for taking action, Absolutely. notably the instability that comes from pollution in China and, frankly, the excuse that's provided to address climate change and to, in doing so, modernize the Chinese economy. Uh, an excuse to shut down the most inefficient, dirty old state-owned enterprises and to re-gear around some of the solutions that are out there, renewable energy solutions, greenhouse gas emissions lowering solutions, like wind turbines and photovoltaic cells, where China's playing a big role, electric cars and batteries and storage. So I'm actually pretty optimistic that China stays the course, uh, and they're frankly, uh, with a very different <coughs> political system than us, putting in a much sharper-edged uh, political framework for delivering on it. 
uh, with a structure of emissions trading and a price on carbon that I think will allow them to do it cost effectively. So um, that's my additional thoughts. So I will just address one point that was present in three of the questions, the one about uh, democratization, about the 1% and about the economy regulation. And basically that's the question of governance, right? We have two levels on which uh, these problems occur. We have the problem level where we have climate change, for example, as a problem. And then we have the solutions, this uh, conductivist orchestra, the various forces that are working together in order to try to solve these problems. And there, of course, we have significant difficulties. What we want, I think, includes two important moves. We want to move in the direction of rule of law. We want more of our conflicts to be resolved through legal mechanisms and fewer through military positioning and so on. And we want democratization. We want uh, ordinary citizens uh, to have more of a voice and their needs and interests to be weighted uh, regardless of what their socioeconomic position might be and what their location might be in this world. And there are countervailing forces. So one important countervailing force is that there are very significant, very powerful agents who have an interest in the world remaining in a state of hostility, tension, the military forces maybe not openly used, but it's at least an always present option. And those are, in the first instance, those countries that are militarily <coughs> stronger than they are economically and morally slash culturally. So the US, for example, has half the world's military strength, but it has only about a quarter of the world's economic strength. And so if tomorrow all weapons lost their relevancy, if they were all taken out of circulation, which is a miracle, the US would see its global power decline. And so would certain offices within the US. So the presidency, as relative to the other branches of government, has more power in situations of tension where military power is being used and so forth than in the situation where the world is uh, as a peaceful environment. And so there's always a bit of a vested interest for the US to remind the world that uh, the world is a dangerous place, that military power matters. And the tendency for the presidency to remind the other branches of government that being the commander in chief is actually a relic of that. So we need to reckon with these difficulties and try, nevertheless, to push the world in the direction of more rule of law. The other point about democratization is that we have the United Nations, and I agree with you, it's a place, it's a great place where ideas can thrive and so on, but if we're honest, it is the United Government. Uh, so you have governments represented there, and the interests of governments are not always coincident with the interests of the population. So uh, it's not a sufficient answer to the demand for democratization to say give more voting power to the smaller governments, uh, populist but uh, economically very weak and so on, because it's not clear that those governments actually represent the populations of the countries fairly. And even the US government, of course, doesn't do that either. And so here in particular, when you think about negotiating trade agreements and so forth, the governments of the developing world are very often representing the interests of a very small elite. The great majority of the population doesn't even know what the issues are. They don't know uh, what hits them, right? We have heard in this conference about uh, a particular elite who represents that people in Bangladesh, they understand the climate is changing, but they don't really know what uh, the causes are and uh, the global mechanisms through which these are happening. And so they don't hold their government to account for its negotiating position about climate change as well. Similarly, uh, what the Indian government does on trade agreements is often driven by the very largest export-oriented countries in India without much regard for the very large relative size of the population that it has a respective on trade agreements. So here, of course, there is a movement afoot to introduce a world parliament within the United Nations. It's a nice idea. I don't think it's particularly realistic for the obvious reason that it would attract some of the power. Power would shift away from the uh, year 10, 20th century statute of the Security Council. And the countries that now have a lot of power on the Indian institutions are likely to resist any such move. But I think that would be progress in the direction. I'd be 
with animal success. Right? And so for the time being, I'm afraid we have to work with this community as they are, make marginal changes, and try to uh, get more substantive results that better reflect human concerns and the, the working of the nation. So that's last not least, thank you for to everybody who has uh, participated in this conference. Um, I think we've had a very interesting 